dream life's not about you, my friend. Had a dream I wanted to sleep next to plastic. A, just such a, a wonderful, heartwarming story. Gosh. You hear stuff like this. So it, it's just, I don't know what's more heartwarming. The whining by Apple or, or this story here. Coming out of Forbes, Roger Friedman, contributor to Forbes. Gave a call to Paula Smith of Hinesville, Georgia. And she has a company called Stickitude. Stickitude.com. Apparently it's like stickers with attitude. Stickitude. And she is doing quite well selling her own version of an anti-Obama bumper sticker that reads, Don't. Renig 2012. Now, I don't know why they have capitalized N, and I don't know why there's a dash between re and nig. Now, of course, renig would be, hey, don't renig 2012. Uh, don't give us the Affordable Care Act and then take it back. Don't. You made a promise to us. Don't break it. I don't. It's weird. I can't quite figure that out. Um, so this guy, Roger Friedman, called her on the phone and said, um, I asked her about the N-word. For which nig is the shortened version. And she said, quote, according to the dictionary, the N-word does not mean black. It means low down, a low down, lazy, sorry, low down person. That's what the N-word means. And, uh, and then this guy did one of those things where, uh, which we rarely see now in journalism. He actually fact-checked her. And he went to Webster's a New Collegiate Dictionary, and the word is defined as any member of any dark-skinned race, taken to be offensive. Dictionary.com says the word is now probably the most offensive word in English. Its degree of offensiveness has increased markedly in recent years, although it's been in use in derogatory manner since at least the Revolutionary War. Where did uh, Ms. Smith find the sticker in the first place? She didn't even come up with it. We just found it on the Internet. I thought it was cute. It's been up there since he's been president, but apparently they're getting a lot more play these days. Uh, she owns a uh, paintball outfit as well. She says she's not racist. She just wants Obama out of office. She says she doesn't have a preferred candidate. And quote, and besides, Obama is not even black. He's got a mixture of race. It's his choice of what nation his nationality is. I think he's probably got to be American to be president. He can't he can't renege on that promise to be uh, American. I am not solely race, nor environment, nor destiny. I am the human scientific process over and over and over again. The dirt that I shovel to uncover the truth often buries something else growing. 
Acceptance of my own weakness and my own intolerance is seldom. But that is in fact my identity. I'm a mixed breed. I call myself Heinz 57. Referring to ancestry that's part French, Scottish, and German. I just want someone that's going to help the United States and not give it other countries all the time. And stop giving the immigrants the benefits that most Americans inside their own states can't even get because they're giving it others who don't even live here as American. Hmm. I do find it amazing and entertaining that one of our stickers has become a racist thing, uh, Ms. Smith told him. Uh... He asked again if she thought the N-word was a bad word. No, she said, because I don't use it. I have kids here around me that are black kids. I call them my own kids. I help black families to guide them in the right direction. Paintball is one of those things. We like to laugh and have a good time. That's our way of life. There you go, folks. Just another American small business trying to make their way through a tough economy. It's, uh, Samuel. It's, it's Kathy. It's Ka- it's Kathy. Uh, it's the Kathy, Kathy Harris. Yes, it's uh, yes. nearly Senator Catherine Harris. Senator or, Catherine well, Harris. Not Hello. quite senator. But uh, let me just uh, if, if people probably remember you, but you were the Secretary of State in Florida who gave us uh, George Bush, and then you were a Congresswoman, and then you didn't win. Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Same old, same old, same old. Where's my movie? I've seen Game Change, Fair Game. Where's my movie? I mean, they had the thing about recount, but Laura Dern did. That was not at all. That was not at all how I apply my makeup. But anyway, Sam, yes. listen to so me. So you, you saw Game Change? Yes. And did you enjoy it? Well, I, I wasn't in it. No, I'm, I know. I know that. No, was... no, I did it. No, the the short answer in a word. No, I didn't. Oh. Did did not. Listen, Sam. Yes. Let's get right to it. I I you were just talking about Michael Bloomberg being worried. Well, I'll say he should be. I know that you are going to be at the Bowery Hotel this evening. That's Is correct. That right for Occupy. The... Well, are, are you going to leave? The defecation piles all over the hotel, all <laughs> over the, no. the Bowery, because Sam, uh, Mayor Mayor Mike has every reason to be alarmed. No, I I, well, I appreciate your mentioning that. I was actually gonna. I I am uh, taking part in the awareness experiment, which is a um, a collective of, of media makers that uh, support Occupy. Yes, that's going to be at the Bowery Hotel on the second floor. But no, your, not... your voice is cutting out. Your voice is cutting. Is that little Jewish fellow, Raviv Allman, going to be there too with you? Yes, he is. Yes, I, I, we hear you fine. I, uh, am I cutting out now? No, now you're fine. Well, I don't want to hear anything about you or that little Raviv defecating in the Bowery Hotel because it's a lovely hotel. Forget about it, cause she's a hotel detective. No, I don't. In fact, uh, I, I make a rule not only to defecate in, uh, in toilets that I have uh, intimate uh, knowledge yeah, of. Yeah, you, you toilets, no you wish. I know you people. You you don't use the indoor blah, 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 plumbing. What do you, what, Speaking of which. What do you mean by you people? You know what I mean. No, I don't. Jews. I'm, so, I'm sorry? Did you say Jews don't don't use indoor plumbing? Where I where did you? I get... didn't then say all of them. Listen, uh, anyway, Sam yeah. Samuel. Speaking of plumbing, as you know, I've been touring with Joseph the plumber.
summer. Oh. On, uh, supporting his Ohio 999 plan in the 9th District. Yes, I know. I understand that. He is the Republican candidate there, and he is supportive of the 999 plan. I had no idea that you were touring with him. Yes. Well, as you know, Jeff Foxworthy is supporting uh, uh, Romney. Yeah. But we just got a wonderful endorsement from Peanut. Jeff Dunham's puppet is going to be endorsing Joseph the Plumber. You know Peanut? <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry. Jeff Dunham. And no, I know. I'm, I'm familiar with Jeff Dunham as a ventriloquist, but you're saying that Jeff Dunham? Just Jeff, Jeff Dunham is supporting, is supporting Santorum right now. So Peanut is with us and Joseph the Plumber in Ohio. That's, um, that's great. That's great news. I guess um, you've wrapped up that entire puppet. Uh, vote. Well, we're also just about to get the endorsement. Have you ever seen that little animated figure of the toenail fungus on those commercials about the fungal infections under your toenail? You know, I don't... And there's a little animated critter that lifts up your toenail to show the fungus that you you can take care of with either, either Lamisil or Dermisil. That, that fungal infection is called onychomycosis. It's got. It leaves a foul odor, and it has a thickening and a darkening of the toenail. Well, the little fella who lifts your toenail to explain it to you, he's endorsing. He's just about to announce that he's endorsing Joseph the Plumber. As well. Wow, that is. Uh, that's quite a coup. <laughs> idea that that uh, onomatocosis uh, onychomycosis I didn't know that that thing was that political but um, that, that that brings me to I wanted to talk to you about the uh, the race um, it's been a while since we talked and in fact um, Michelle Bachman uh, is who you were supporting is no longer in the race. No, Michelle Mappel was in Illinois last night trying to, you know, it was very sunny yesterday uh, in Chicago. As you know, there's a low voter turnout because, as you know, you know, the Republican uh, Party is so white now, and there are so many albinos even that the, the sunlight is very hard on their skin and their eyes. And they find it hard to come out and vote. Wait, are you GOP saying you're party. saying that the reason why the voter turnout in Chicago, which apparently was the lowest it's been in 70 years, right, was because, because of the sun? Because Republicans were afraid of getting sun. But well, there's so, when your skin is so white, you know, your eyes are very light sensitive because of the lack of melanin. I... So there's a low white voter turnout when the sun is shining, and that's not good for Republicans. <laughs> See, I had no, I had no idea that that was uh, the problem. And, right, and Michelle was trying to help the albinos, but they just couldn't do it. They couldn't find. They could. They couldn't see. It was so sunny, <laughs> so, so they couldn't come out and vote. So you're telling me that Michelle Bachman was attempting. Michelle Mabel, yes, she was trying to escort the white voters out into the sun, but they found it very difficult. Because of the burning, the burning, and the sensation. gnashing of the teeth, the gnashing of the teeth. I'm not sure I understand where the gnashing of the teeth comes from. In. The pain of the sunlight on their eyes and their skin. But you didn't. Or, but let's uh, hold on for a second now. So uh, aside from that, you, you didn't mention like Michelle Bachman. She was your, she was the the horse. Right, and then as we discussed before, Sam, then we deferred to the males in the party. We are there to serve. And so wait, wait, I'm sorry. You're saying that Michelle Bachman dropped out because it's uh, she is deferring to the other candidates who are male, who are doing a little better than Michelle. That is women's work. And also we are spending a great deal of time trying to find out about all those liars trying to get their abortions. All the liars? All the lying that's going on. You know, the Idaho, the state senator in Idaho, who talked about all the women who are lying about rape and incest to get their abortion.
Well, it's true. So, you know, a, a woman will say anything to get that abortion. You know what I mean? You, you've heard, the dog ate my homework, the checks in the mail, I was raped. You know, that's, those old chestnuts. A likely story. Wait a second. Why would women lie, I mean, to get an abortion? Uh, uh, you so you're, you're saying that they don't want to say that That's they- what Planned Parenthood does. It turns women into liars and harlots and Jezebels. Harlots and Jezebels and liars. Yeah, because that's they what all Planned Parenthood does. And your progressive East Coast liberal Jewish elitist university latte drinking worldview turns women into liars. They'll say anything to get an abortion. I... Anything. Have you had so it's up to the doctor to have to do the legwork. But, you know, they can't all be house, can they? They can't all be what? House. You know, he goes the extra mile. Who's house? Or Quincy. Remember Quincy, Sam? I sure do. Yeah, but he was Remember wasn't... how much he used to find out if people were lying yeah, or if they he... committed a murder? But wasn't he actually like a coroner? Or a he was a officer? coroner, but what I mean is he did the legwork. He did his due diligence. Planned Parenthood turns women into liars. Well, but you're you're aware that um, abortions are legal in this country. They're a legal medical procedure. What? Abortion is legal. The Supreme Court. I, that's, I don't. Now you're a liar. What? You're no, lying. no. This is a the the Supreme Court Roe v. Wade. No, no. I think you're mistaken, Sam. I think you're very much mistaken. Abortion is not legal in this country because the Father God praised him. White power would never allow such a thing. No, wait, it, it is. In fact, it's been... The uh, Father God's laws praise him. White power, Breitbart, he would never allow, never allow such a thing. I'm sorry, did you say, did you say, uh, uh, did you say Breitbart? The fat, the fat. I'm sorry, I thought you said... Oh, I thought you were never going to mention that name again. <laughs> well, yeah, I thought you were never going to mention his name again. See, you're a liar. See, and by the way, you know what I was talking about with Joseph the Plumber? No. A few weeks ago, you were talking about Marshall McLuhan. By the way, it's McLuhan, not McLaren. Okay. Were you, you, were you I, thinking of really Malcolm McLaren? to the... Listen, I, I, I don't like, Joseph was very upset. He, you were saying Marshall McLaren. Now, were you thinking of Malcolm McLaren who helped with Vivian Westwood kick off the punk revolution? It's Fashion been, wise, it's very possible. I, based on just, the look of Richard Hell and the Voidoids? Is that, I mean, if you were confused, Sam, but it's Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan, the, yes. Not uh, the McLaren. Media is the, the medium is the message, correct? Exactly. Well, right. you know it now. Well, okay. I didn't now. realize that you and Joe the Plumber both listened to the show. That jo- much. Joseph, of course you need to keep your enemies close, sir. You've heard that old joke. Well, that's not very nice to say. Are you suggesting that I'm your enemy? What? Are you suggesting that I'm your enemy? Sam, you know, this is a war, praise him, white power, Breitbart. I'm just saying that we need to, that the war on... On Christmas is going to be gearing up again soon. It's it's almost war on Christmas it's season. March. So we got why is there a war on it Christmas? It starts earlier and earlier every year with you people. <laughs> the war on Christmas it we're, gets we're, earlier we're, and earlier every Easter's year. Easter's in between <laughs> us now. Shouldn't we have, so, have a war on Easter before then? Oh, don't worry. We have already got our our uh, our soldiers ready for the war on Easter. But I'm telling you, the war on Christmas gets earlier and earlier every year. Doesn't it seem like that, Sam? Merry Christmas. I don't want to fight tonight with. <laughs> I don't, 
you know, I don't really see that there is a war on Christmas. No, you won't. And what you? You're probably too busy defecating at the Bowery Hotel with Raviv Holman. At the uh, awareness experiment. Yeah, no, I'm not going to be defecating at the Bowery Hotel. There's no. I'm telling you, there's something rotten in Denmark. Me thinks, me thinks it doesn't pass the smell test, Sam. What, what is rotten in Denmark? I'm not sure I, I follow. What the you're defecation. Saying. The defecation. And when I say Denmark, of course, I mean the Bowery. So you're saying that there's people defecating in the Bowery now, and that's part of uh, what Bloomberg has been talking about. And that's what you're Well, talking. wherever Occupy goeth, defecation doth follow, does it not? Well, look, you're aware that everyone poops. I mean, that's I've, I, we've actually got a, a, a book for my child. I mean, it's people. there's no reports yeah. of people defecating anywhere, I mean, other than in a bathroom. There have been allegations of defecation that have reached far and wide. Listen, the Tea Party people, as we've discussed before, they, they are very used to not having indoor plumbing. The average Tea Party member still does not have indoor plumbing in their homes. I don't think so they actually. know what to do defecating outside. So they'll be quite ready for the zombie apocalypse when it, when it does happen. They'll know how to survive and defecate with great discretion and decorum outside. Wait a second. Wait a second. What, wait, what is the zombie apocalypse and why won't there be toilets? Sam, have you not been watching that documentary series on AMC, The Walking Dead? Wait, it's The a, Walking Dead? I don't the, think that's The a documentary book. series, The Walking Dead. That's a, I don't it's think. happening in Atlanta, Georgia. But surprisingly, very few African-American zombies. That's the weirdest thing. That in Atlanta, Georgia, Sam, I, that, and yet, where's all the African Americans? Uh, 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 what are they up to? What are they up to? What What are the African Americans are up to? Yeah, where is they're in Atlanta, Georgia, in that documentary, The Walking Dead, and yet I see a lot of white people, a lot of white undead walkers, as they're called. Walkers. I, I, I got to tell you, I don't think that that is a documentary I th I'm, I'm 95 to oh right and next you're going to say true blood is in a documentary a likely story what are you going to say next you were raped <laughs> that I was raped yes, no I'm not, I, I think that I uh, look I I think it's quite provable as to whether or not it's a documentary I don't know what the rape uh, well has to do with it I'm but, just talking about all the lying Sam the lying. all the lying to get your abortions and well uh, former near, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm a little, I have to, uh, just call me Kathy. Keep it simple. Kathy, Kathy Harris. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, I, don't forget, don't forget Joseph, the plumber, nine, 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 Ohio's ninth district. Praise him. White power, Breitbart. And don't forget, we've got peanut Jeff Dunham's puppet supporting coming out. We're just about to get an announcement from the animated character who lifts up your toenails. In. That is great. Yes, we're uh, well. I'm looking forward to that, and uh, hopefully you can uh, come back uh, real soon and report on the progress that you're making in the ninth district. Yes, we will, and uh, and you and uh, we'll we'll have our eyes on you tonight at the Bowery Hotel. Well, I we're going to be. We're going to be keeping close tabs and taking names and photos of all the defecants, all the defecants on the Bowery. I think you might be using that word incorrectly, but uh, I think you uh, – right, that's I fine. I think you might be. I think you might well, be. Well, I think defecant is – I don't I, – uh, I, I don't have time to look that up. Someone uh, – well, that's I'm not – I'm sure you don't. Now, it's uh, – what, what do you call it, McLaren's? You call it McLaren. Okay, well, uh, near C Kathy Harris, thank you so much for thank joining you, us. Samuel. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Majority Report. It is a pleasure to welcome to this program once again Matt Taibbi of Rolling Stone magazine. Hello, Matt. How are you? What's going on, Sam? Uh, just hanging out. I'm a little bit tired today. Uh, but, uh, oh, yeah? Yeah, I'm a, but I'm a broadcast professional. You would have no idea that that was the case if I hadn't told you that. That's right. I would never have known if you didn't no, tell me. It would have been a complete, you would have walked away saying, well, Sam sounds like he's very well rested. <laughs> so, uh, you got a blockbuster piece in uh, uh, Rolling Stone magazine. That is, I mean, you could uh, you could you could just take it down to your local police department and um, <laughs> and simply just uh, uh, you know ha- put it on file as a rap sheet. But you outline how Bank of America is uh, both. Oh, boy. I mean, how to put this? They're both, uh, in some respects, uh, incompetent, but really, more importantly, they are so rife with fraud. Their history has been so rife with fraud. They're, they're, they, they almost grounded in a – they exist almost uh, from a seed of just horribleness that has <laughs> sort of grown into a wonderful – forest of just uh, uh, corruption a publicly subsidized forest yes yeah. and let's let's go through this i mean it's 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 a huge piece and you know these i i i, I mean it's sort of breathtaking when you sit back you read this thing and you and you sort of absorb this just how it it really speaks to a larger problem in this country, I, I think, particularly because of the size of this uh, bank. But just for a moment, talk about how big Bank of America is and how it got that way. Well, right now, Bank of America controls about 12% of all the uh, banking deposits in, in the country, uh, which it's not supposed to do. We actually have a cap that says that no bank can... Um, can control more than 10%, but they kind of got around those rules because there's a little loophole that says that you're allowed to temporarily go over that amount if it's an acquisition. Um, so they, uh, they they went over that amount. Uh, they now control uh, roughly 17 to 18% of the mortgage market as well. Uh, so when you're looking at the just the, the sheer financial assets of the United States, uh, between banking deposits and and, and uh, real estate, you know, Bank of America is essentially you know 10 to 15 percent of the American financial services industry. That's not really, that's not an exaggeration at all. So it's a, it's a gigantic company uh, that's gr- getting more and more uh, gigantic all the time. And uh, this is a bank that essentially came out of, um, uh, well, it, it, it started, I guess, in North Carolina. It wasn't, um, right. and, and it, it just, it, it grew and grew and grew. And uh, you talk about how it, there, it, it started from this sort of competition as to um, who, uh, who had more swagger between these two uh, guys in North Carolina, Hugh McCall and Ed Crutchfield. Just talk about that because I think, you know, the interesting thing is, uh, it didn't have to be this way, and there's no – at the end of the day, um, there is really no rationale for a bank to be this big. No, no. I mean, and a lot of the people that I talked to said that uh, – pointed to the fact that – going back to the end of the 90s, there were all these studies that uh, had been conducted about – what's the most efficient size for a bank? And they all kind of universally agree that once you get over about $5 billion in assets, the, the uh, efficiency starts to go down, uh, in large part because the loan quality starts to suffer. And one of the, one of the main advantages that a, a small regional bank has is that it knows who it's lending money to. It, it sees the people physically. It has a good idea of what kind of investment it's getting itself into. A friend's a friend who knows what being a friend is Talking with a friend As friends we were always so close but And then once you get to the point where it's a gigantic, you know, uh, international conglomerate that's making decisions based on scoring systems and computerized formulas rather than face-to-face contact, 
uh, they start to make worse and worse decisions. So there's no there's no capitalist rationale for getting for making a bigger bank. It's not more profitable. It just so happens that this particular company was is run by a guy who just wanted to get bigger. This guy Hugh McCall and his uh, adversary Ed Crutchfield, who ran First Union, he ended up creating Wachovia, which became Wells Fargo. And so that was it was this rivalry to see who could have the taller skyscraper, and that's really what it was all about. These guys just wanted to be bigger for the sake of it. It's essentially, um, you know, it, it, and of course, if we were to have uh, uh, capped that and prevented it, we would have been reducing the amount of freedom for a couple of jerk-offs right. to be jerk-offs at the expense, ultimately, of uh, the taxpayer and the broader economy. Yeah, and this is, a, this is a kind of an important point because the argument in favor of Bank of America is, or this kind of company is, well, we shouldn't have regulations that prevent companies from getting uh, as organically big as they want to get. But the problem is Bank of America actually benefited from state regulations. It could never have gotten as big as it got without protection from the government. In the mid-'80s, there was a partial over, there used to be a law that said that you couldn't have a bank in more than one state so all banks were interest state banks the, the biggest ones then there was a ruling in the mid 80s a supreme court ruling that says that you could cross state lines within a designated area that allowed bank of america to start gobbling up banks in the southeast but it also protected them from banks in new york uh which could not cross into their designated area so they were allowed to go on the shopping spree where they didn't have to compete with City Citibank and uh and other major depository institutions that were much bigger than they were. So it's not like this is an, a freedom argument that they they got as much state aid in getting big as they did uh you know in, in as there was state aid repressing them in the in the early days. Yeah, I mean I think uh this has been an ongoing uh argument that I've had with uh libertarians calling into the program this notion of like we we just need to reduce government to a certain extent and 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 that's a perfect example of you know at one point you stop reducing government and there's still protections and inevitably they go to the guy who's paying for uh who's contributing most to um the the uh the the, the campaigns of local politicians and they get the benefit right. that way um sure and, and, you know, you, you, you quoted him, I think, uh, McCall, in saying that uh, we realized if we didn't leave North Carolina, we would never amount to anything. That we would not be important. Right, right. Not that we wouldn't be profitable, but that we wouldn't be important. And I, I think a lot of people that I talked to pointed that out is that what really motivated these guys is, is that they just wanted to be bigger. They wanted to be something. You know, they were like Marlon Brando in the, on, on the waterfront. You know, I could have been somebody, you know. And I think that's what these guys, they didn't want to be provincial hicks from, from North Carolina. They wanted to be world-class financiers. And, and that always-get-bigger mindset was what it ultimately should have destroyed the company back in 2007 and 2008. Bank of America, they, this guy McCall had already acquired the, the San Francisco-based bank, Bank of America, uh, and he was already a thriving mortgage company, but he wanted to be the biggest mortgage dealer in America, so he went and he bought Countrywide, which was a gigantic ball of fraud and future litigation. It was already collapsing in 2007, but he doubled down on the mistake. He First, he invested in it, and then he bought it. Uh, and that should have destroyed the company because it left them with this gigantic pile of liabilities. But they ended up getting a gigantic uh, federal bailout to keep them in business. Uh, and it, again, it's just that instinct to always get bigger that kept letting, leading them into trouble. We sing the last of good King Richard. They, that, that he bought Countrywide at that time because they were aware they had a massive problem on their hands and he thought Countrywide was going to save the company. I mean, you know, when I read it now, I mean, I remember when Bank of America acquired Countrywide, but when, you know, with the, with the uh, sort of the, the sobriety of hindsight, I realized, wait, he, they bought this company in 2008? On the precipice of all this falling apart, they bought the, they they added this type of liability. I mean, this is this it, now when you look back on it, it, looks like a hail mary. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at it. Um, you know, the way I look at it, 
people have to realize that these companies like Countrywide and Long Beach um, and New Century, these, so there were sort of these fly-by-night subprime lenders. They had a very particular role in, in the mortgage business, which was they were they were completely unscrupulous. Their job was to give loans to everybody that had a pulse, everybody they could find. And the banks knew they were doing this. Now, they didn't want to get their hands dirty personally, the companies like Bank of America and Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase. But they did want to do business with these companies. Uh, they lent them billions of dollars. They basically said, go out and make loans to everybody you can find. We'll buy those loans back, and then we'll, we'll chop them up and sell them off to unions and pension funds and foreigners and make it look like AAA-rated you know, good investments. So they they were essentially outsourcing their their predatory criminal lending to companies like Countrywide and New Century and Long Beach. And I th- my take on this whole thing is when Countrywide started to falter, they just essentially decided to buy up the whole mess to try to keep it in house. Uh, I mean that's one take on it. Um, certainly it, it it turned out that way that they kind of concentrated all their liability under one roof rather than having it out there. Uh, in separate litigations. Do you think it's also possible um, that the that uh, Bofa bought Countrywide because they figured like we need to get even we need to be even a bigger problem. In other words, I've heard. Um, I think it was uh, Joseph Stieglitz yeah, who told me that Cebris yeah. bought Chrysler, knowing full well that ultimately they would get a a government bailout. And mm-hmm. it seems to me that, you know, in this situation, uh, if you're going down uh, and, and your, your ship is taking on water and uh, you have the opportunity to sort of like, oh, there's the uh, crown prince. I'm going to grab them and put them on the boat. Right, I'm sure right. to get rescued in that situation, uh, that they actually assumed more of this liability as a way of making them an even more explosive. You know, w- once you have uh, BOFA and Countrywide together, the liability and Merrill is so Lynch. great. And Merrill Lynch, the liability so great that there's almost no chance that they're not going to get some type of bailout. I mean, I, I guess it would be hard to prove that kind of intent. I mean, this is kind of the difference between first and second degree murder, I guess. But, uh, you know, they clearly that happened. And clearly that that dynamic ended up coming into play that once they had Countrywide and Merrill Lynch and Bank of America, which is already, you know, owns 10% of America's deposits under their that one roof, there was no way the government could allow them to go over the edge. It would just, especially in that chaos of 2000, of 2008, when all these different companies were teetering on the edge of collapse, I think they must have, the government must have identified this, this company and said, this is one of the five or six companies we can't allow to, to collapse because it would just, the footprint would be too huge if, if they were to go under. And yeah, who knows? Maybe that was a, a motivation. It's not a very smart motivation. Well, I mean, who knows? It is. I mean, they've, they've essentially won a get-out-of-jail-free card for life now uh, by making that acquisition. So, I mean, who, who knows? And, and and we should say that when you say that Countrywide, um, they their, uh, their modus operandi was to go out and make these horrible loans consciously, you know, not this right. is not a, a measure. This is not incompetence. This is consciously saying, like, we're going to strip the primary function of a mortgage lender's um, sort of, you know, uh, raison d'etre, which is to actually make sure that they're giving out good loans. Uh, you, you, you note that a federal judge in a uh, SEC investigation, and there's a quote, Countrywide routinely ignored its official underwriting guidelines to such a extent that uh, country, Countrywide would underwrite any loan it could sell. Did right, they, right. It's yeah, com- no. It's completely contrary to why these, these entities function. Well, yeah, it, unless you look at it for what its real purpose was. People need to understand that this, this whole thing was a scam. You know, if you here in New York, if you look out your window, you see people selling, you know, phony Prada pocketbooks out out in the street. That's exactly what they were doing with these mortgages. They the whole thing was a scam to take loans, chop them up, disguise them as better performing loans and then sell them to pension funds and unions and foreigners and insurance companies uh all over the world. And so they, what they needed, they needed the raw material. They needed to create these loans so that they could 
put them into the grinder and and apply a whole bunch of phony baloney derivative math to them and rechristen them AAA rated securities. So Countrywide's entire purpose was to create loans. It wasn't to create good loans because they weren't going to hold them. As soon as they made those loans, they sold them off to a bank, back to a company like Bank of America, who in turn sold them off immediately to some other sucker down the line. So they they had no interest in in making a good loan because they they didn't care they weren't going to they weren't going to have that loan for more than 10 seconds uh and so yeah they had essentially no lending standards their 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 standards were do we already have a customer for the loan and and we should say that you know uh just to add to that analogy about somebody goes and buys something on the street and they come home they take it they 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 take it home and they find it's defective the difference here is that there is no uh indication to the customer in this situation that they're buying something off the street inside but made out all right i jumped on my thought i went off but i felt torn i could You know, most people uh, don't work in, the, in these industries, and they assume if I walk into a place that uh, is uh, issuing uh, mortgages, they know what they're doing, and it's sanctioned, and they're operating under guidelines. Yeah, no, and, and it goes even farther than that. I mean, if you go into a supermarket and you and you buy a, a, a steak that has a you know USDA grade A uh, stamp on it, uh, well, you then you, know, you think that that's good quality meat, right? And and that's essentially what you had with these loans. They had the stamp of approval of Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and all the good ratings agencies who gave a lot of these loans AAA ratings. Um, and, <clears throat> of course, it turned out later that these ratings agencies were financially dependent upon those banks and that they were essentially selling their high ratings to these companies. But if you're a union fund manager and, and you're you know from the state of Mississippi and, and or you know, Los Angeles County, and you're going to buy an investment for your pension fund, and somebody says, and Bank of America, you know, the world's biggest bank for one of them anyway, says to you, here's a AAA rated security. Are you really going to wonder, you know, <laughs> are you really going to think that it might actually be a, a loan belonging to an unemployed janitor from, you know, the, the slums of Arizona? I mean, you just don't, you don't make that connection in your mind, at least, at least you didn't before. Now people do. All right. So now um, uh, I want to I want to move uh, past the acquisition of Countrywide, but there's still, I, I, you know, it's, it's still just sort of it just boggles the mind because we know and you, you, you report here that there was an internal email distributed in June of 2006 where Countrywide's own executives worried that 40 percent of the firm's reduced documentation loans, which are these sort of liar loans uh, where you come in and say, like, yeah, we'll trust you. <laughs> Uh, as to what, right. you know, and, and people are encouraged to do this because, of course, it's it means that they can avoid their own company's uh, standards. Um, they knew that uh, had income overstated uh, more than 10 percent, a significant percent of those loans would have been overstated by 50 percent or more. We also know that U.S. Bank Corp in a, uh, a later lawsuit said that um, they, they saw that once they bought Countrywide's loans, they became delinquent and defaulted at a startling rate. How does a company like Bank of America go in and before they do an acquisition, I know they send over forensic auditors, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they're called forensic auditors. How do they not find that? Oh, no, they find it. I mean, they, they know. They, they clearly know and, and, and Countrywide clearly knew uh that these loans were not of the same quality that they were representing um look again this was the this was a scam this was all about creating stuff to sell to somebody else who didn't know what they were buying and and so uh yeah it, at the countrywide level they were you know they were saying to people who were taking out these loans okay i mean you make you make 30,000 but maybe sometimes you make 40 or 50 right and they, they would they would boost the income levels like that in the applications and everybody knew that this was going on. They knew it at Countrywide. They knew it at the, the banks who were buying the loans. 
It was only the customer who was three or four links down the chain. He was the one who didn't know about all this stuff. systematic effort at covering up uh, the poor quality of these loans. And then, and, and, and then there's a, another sort of half of the equation of this cover-up ends up uh, coming on the, the, uh, the foreclosure side. In other words, um, what the, because they were creating this mill where they would just sort of securitize these loans uh, and they were doing such a volume business, they had to to basically take shortcuts and then uh well explain that because I, well they didn't they didn't have to they just did, they did right here let's put it this way okay so if you're a bank in the old days and you issue a loan to somebody and you're going to hold that loan for 20 or 30 years well you're going to you're going to properly service that loan like if you're going to if you if you're going to resell it You'll walk down to the county clerk's office and you'll pay the fee to, to to do the deed transfer and you'll physically pick up that piece of paper and move it from one place to another like you're supposed to by law. But because these banks, their whole game was let's get a whole bunch of loans and then sell them off and and take off with the money, they just stopped doing their paperwork. They you know once they once they made that loan, packaged it and sold it off. They washed their hands of it and stopped doing their work. And so not only did they not do their paperwork anymore, they didn't pay the local fees that they were supposed to for deed transfers every time these loans were sold or bought and sold. Uh, and so the only time they did the paperwork was when they had, when someone had to foreclose on the, on the property. They just went back and they made up all the paperwork. They, they, they assigned whole details of like entry level kids and said, we w- we'd like you to reconstitute the history of this loan, and then you can sign it as a vice president or something, and we'll get a notary, a notary to stamp it. And it's just a mass perjury operation. That's what robo signing is. I mean, it's fascinating because you start to see how it's sort of it's you know it's one of those people who you know you tell one lie and then you know uh, uh, months later you've got to tell a dozen more lies to support that right. first lie. And that's the thing is that this this is so large. Uh, it, it, it's almost as if because, you know, right now, of course, this country is suffering uh, dramatically in terms of the recession because of the loss of home value. Uh, but it was the this banking industry that inflated this bubble so significantly and then right. uh, created its own financial crisis, which sort of uh, precipitated or I guess was a, a, a immediate result of this bubble um, uh, exploding. And so it, it, it really is. That's the amazing thing again about your piece. I'm not I'm not blowing smoke here is just that yeah, it's, it's you the see scale the of it. That's so amazing. Thing. Yes. Right. Um, all right, right. So then, so the other, so th- if it was not bad enough that they um, they uh, they fraudulently foreclose on people, they um, skirted, it, it, and, and if they had to file that paperwork, of course, much of this, it seems to me, would have been much harder to do. I don't know that it would have made it impossible, oh, yeah. but it would have certainly made it much harder to do. Yeah, and let's just talk for a minute about how they started it. What they did is the banks got together and they created a private electronic registry system called MERS, uh, where instead of doing the physical deed transfers, they just paid a few pennies to some company called MERS, which became technically the owner of like a third of America's mortgages. Uh, and they didn't ask for anybody for permission to do this. They didn't go to the government and say, hey, we don't want to do the paperwork anymore, so we're going to hire this company to do it by computer. They just went ahead and did it. And when they did that, they allowed all the banks in America to systematically evade local fees, you know, probably for hundreds of billions of dollars. But that's just a small aside in this whole picture. Uh, and, but that's how they did it. On top of that, just to sort of almost like uh, uh, prove the point that this wasn't um, a 
uh, an anomaly. Like, you know, oh, we, we headed down this road. <laughs> we just had to keep going. They, they're engaged in all different other types of fraud that um, just seem to just reflect just an incredible cor- uh, culture of corruption there. Uh, right. Talk about what they did with HAMP. Well, yeah, in that, in that instance, uh, <laughs> it's unclear exactly what the benefit was to these banks, but they, they, uh, HAMP was this uh, program the, from the Obama administration that essentially would give money to the banks uh, and the banks would then distribute that money to struggling homeowners who were having trouble making their payments. Uh, it was an incentive for the banks to provide modifications of loans for people who were near foreclosure. But <laughs> what Bank of America got caught doing was they would consistently promise people that they would get this, this HAMP modification, uh, and then when it came time to actually give out the mod, uh, they would they would stop picking up their phone, and or they would kind of systematically say the dog ate my homework and it, whenever it came time to deliver they would just not do it uh there are some people who allege that they they took their end of the hemp money uh and then just held and then didn't distribute it to to the uh to the actual homeowners but um yeah that's something that they got caught doing and then they dragged it out and it would foreclose on these people yeah no yeah then they, so so essentially instead of foreclosing and pulling the band-aid off quickly and and Putting people into foreclosure and and where they can start getting on with their lives again. Now you're saying we'd like to get a couple more payments from you, and they drag the process out for four, five, six, eight more months. They get that many more payments, and then at the end they still get foreclosed on. So it's, like, it's just like doubling down in the misery. And then uh, in South Carolina, they uh, were distributing the unemployment benefits through basically uh, debit cards, and they screwed those people. Right, yeah, no, they they got a contract to distribute unemployment insurance benefits, and uh, so people would get these little prepaid Bank of America cards. But then it turned out afterwards that if you uh, if you didn't use a Bank of America ATM machine, I remember in South Carolina, in some of these places, like you know, if people live 30 miles from the nearest state Bank of America ATM machine, um, if you didn't use a Bank of America ATM, you could pay fees of as much as ten dollars per per time per withdrawal. Uh, so I'm sure that's not what the state had in mind when it decided to uh, uh, give out that contract. And when you're talking about ten dollars a pop for people on unemployment, that's a big that's a big deal. Oh yeah, yeah, and and again, it just it runs completely counter to to what this uh, what the spirit of unemployment insurance benefits are, and why should a why should Bank of America get uh, get a cut of any any of that stuff? It uh, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> And then you get into things like the. Oh, go ahead. No, well, why did why why would South Carolina even make that deal at that point? I mean, uh, uh, you know, if it's supposedly convenient, well, I mean, it's not convenient to to, to pay ten bucks uh, unless you're willing to drive thirty miles to get your cash. Right, right, yeah. No, there, this is a kind of a phenomenon that's going on all over the country where we're outsourcing various uh, financial services to to banks like Bank of America and Chase and. And so, you know, when you pay out welfare benefits or unemployment insurance benefits or tax returns, now suddenly instead of just writing a check and sending it to the person in the mail, you know, now they're getting it through a bank, they're getting a prepaid debit card, and the bank is getting some kind of cut like 1.5% on the whole deal. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but it adds up to money, that, and it's just free money for the banks. I mean, they don't really have to do anything for it. Uh, So, yeah, it's it's a strange, strange kind of trade-off for sure. And then there's about uh, a half a dozen different ways that uh, these guys have either gotten direct uh, payments of tax dollars uh, or gotten essentially 0% loans of tax dollars or have offloaded uh, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of crappy mortgages that taxpayers have to make up for. Um, the one thing I want to talk about, because this still sort of shocks me, and it seems to me it's a sort of a ticking time bomb here, is uh, the the move of Merrill Lynch assets <laughs> into the other, um, essentially, uh, different books in Bank of America so that they could be backstopped. Right. By, explain that to us. 
Yeah, so uh, last summer, Bank of America was in trouble, right? A whole bunch of their creditors and counterparties were freaking out because, you know, Bank of America acquired Merrill Lynch, and Merrill Lynch had this whole portfolio of, like, really exotic, complicated, derivative uh, instruments, uh, mostly based on mortgages, that were sitting there, and they could unwind, and, and if, they, if they went the wrong way, then suddenly there's this massive... Uh, string of losses uh, on Bank of America's books. And so their creditors and counterparties said, hey, we're not going to lend you any more money uh, or, uh, or we're going to start demanding cash from you unless you move all that crap from Merrill Lynch onto Bank of America. Because if you move it to Bank of America's books, now it's FDIC insured. And if it all blows up, we don't have to pay for it. The state will pay for it. And so that's what Bank of America did. They moved about two and a half trillion do- trillion dollars <laughs> worth of stuff from Merrill Lynch to Bank of America. And now, if it all blows up, we get to pay for it How and, is that instead legal? of their creditors. Uh, well, the Federal Reserve Act, and the funny thing about this, it says that you're allowed to do that as long as the instruments are generally of high quality. Now, some people don't believe that this stuff is of high quality, and then there's certainly a difference of opinion in the government as to whether that's legal or not. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that this is actually done all the time. The reason that this is, uh, it was frowned, it was noticed in Bank of America's case is that it was such a, an outrageous example of when you shouldn't do it. I mean, this is a company that's in serious trouble, and the instruments in question were particularly dangerous. But we, we actually allow this all the time. Companies like Goldman and City, they do this all the time. bailouts um, and, and certainly we in, in, in the most recent bailout as far as I'm concerned is the fact that they got off with this um, uh, uh, DOJ brokered uh, financial fraud settlement deal which is just the latest essentially bailout for this company um, right the at the end of the day what we could have done with this company is it's one thing to sort of bail it out to maintain the the financial system, but at that point, we should have started dismantling this thing slowly and in a controlled manner, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Everybody I talk to, you know, who's kind of like-minded with, uh, uh, on this this topic, they all say the same thing. This company, if it's too big to fail, it's too big to exist. So what we should do is just take it over. Uh, you know, if it needs a bailout, we should just walk, come in, take it over, sell it off into smaller regional banks and basically undo that shopping spree that guys like Hugh McCall went on when they just started buying stuff to get bigger. Uh, there's, you know, this, this could be a, a, a series of very effective companies if they were smaller regional banks. But instead, what we're doing is we're allowing this company that has a long history of fraud and bid rigging and trying to rig the LIBOR, you know, the international interest rates and it's a rogue criminal organization, and we're keeping it in business, which is like a double whammy, right? Because not only are we supporting, uh, uh, you know, an, an inefficient institution, but we're also over, you know, looking the other way towards crime and fraud, which guarantees that more of it's going to happen. Right. So it's the wrong decision all the way around. It's just unbelievable. It's a great piece, uh, Matt Taibbi. Uh, thanks so much for coming on and walking us through this it it really is if if people really want to fully get a sense uh it's a great bank of america is a great metaphor in fact i guess it's not even a metaphor it's a big part of it uh for just what went wrong and what is still incredibly wrong with uh our financier sector